So, buenos días, good morning, uh, welcome everyone to another seminar research webinar. This year, part of the webinars will be supporting the joint research project on household financial decisions coordinated by SEMLA and CAF in Banco de Desarrollo de America Latina, with researchers from nine Latin American and Caribbean central banks. The objective of this joint research is the development of a better understanding of the factors that determine and underlie the financial decisions and behaviors of households in the region. Webinars with future presentation by academics and experts sorry, and who specialize in financial inclusion and financial education topics. Today, we are delighted to have with us Dean Carlin, Professor of Economics at Yale University and President of Innovation for Poverty Action. Professor Carlin is on the Executive Committee of the Board of Directors of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology the Amil Poverty Action Lab. He is co-founder of a website that uses lessons from behavioral economics to help people reach personal goals through commitment contracts. He received a Presidential Early Career Award for scientists and engineers and was named an Alfred P. Sloan Fellow. His research focuses on microeconomic issues on financial decision making. In microfinance, he has studied credit impact interest rate policy, savings product design, credit scoring policies, entrepreneurship training, and group versus individual liability. He received a PhD in economics from MIT and an MBA and an FMP from the University of Chicago and a Bachelor in International Affairs from the University of Virginia. I would like to request the participant to ask your questions at the end of the presentation. We will have 20, 30 minutes for questions and discussion. So welcome, Dean. Thank you very much. And over to you. Great. Um, hi, everybody. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be able to do this type of, um, this type of presentation with all of you. I, I um, look forward to the Q&A section in particular, because I'm very keen to know what are the types of issues that you all are facing um, in this space of financial inclusion. Um, and so hopefully the presentation I'm going to give you gives you some broad stroke ideas on some of what we see as the main barriers that are out there in the world and some of the under our understanding of how to tackle them um, and, and some very specific projects that we've engaged in or others have engaged in that shed some um, useful insights. So I'm going to start um, by talking about a little bit of more, oh, I'm using the wrong thing, I'm sorry. That's <laughs> um, by explaining a little bit more about what IPA is and what the work is we're doing at Financial Inclusion, and then I'll dig into a broad um, overview of financial inclusion. So Innovations for Poverty Action is a nonprofit organization. We are headquartered in New Haven, Connecticut. Uh, we have been working in Peru from the very, very beginning of our or, of the entity. I did my dissertation research actually in Ayacucho, Peru, and um, and work out of that, that that followed up with that was some of the the very, very first projects that IPA did on testing out business training for micro entrepreneurs with a micro lending organization in in Peru. Um, and but we've done projects in in many parts of 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 um, Latin America, Mexico, Peru, um, Colombia, Dominican Republic, Bolivia are some of the main countries where we have a lot of projects, but we've worked in, in other countries as well. IPA has two basic missions, two parts to its mission, and, and that can be seen in this diagram, which I realize you might be saying to yourself has five pieces, but in a sense you can see that there's an important divide between the first three and the fourth and the fifth. And the first three are all about generation of knowledge, learning what works and what doesn't and why in fighting and trying to address various social problems. And sometimes that process requires some innovation and IPA does get involved in innovating and in working with organizations, policymakers, <coughs> excuse me, to try to figure out what is a new idea that can be tried. The heart of what IPA does on the ground is set up randomized trials to test what works and what does not. Another key part of IPA's mission is to say, 
to recognize that a study that's done once in one place might be very interesting. We might feel like we learn a lot. But we're going to learn a lot more if we see this replicated in other settings and we can understand what are the what is the scope within which these lessons hold? Um, how robust are the, are the results? And that's what the replicate part is. And the second part of IPA is about getting these ideas out to the people that actually need them, right? Outside, to be perfectly crass of my profession, outside of academia. Because we don't want the research merely to satisfy our academic curiosity. We want it to be usable and actionable by policymakers, practitioners. And so that's about communicating and about scaling. And that's the that's the, the second half of IPA's work. For the financial inclusion work, there's um, we have been working on financial inclusion from the very beginning of our uh, of our creation. It's one of the, the larger portions of IPA's work, although IPA does work across other sectors as well. Um, we have primarily done this work with support from the City Foundation and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And this support allows us, has allowed us to do research across many different domains within financial inclusion, from credit to savings to payments to understanding more about regulatory policy. And so, so a lot of the research I'm going to share with you now has been funded by the City Foundation and Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, so, so what is financial inclusion? When we talk about financial inclusion, we're really talking about three different aspects. We're talking about having it so that more people have access to appropriate formal financial products. And I'm putting a lot on the word appropriate when I say this. Um, because it's one thing to have a product available in the market, but if it's not appropriate for a particular user in terms of the way the cash flows are structured or the price, then it's effectively not, um, it's, it's irrelevant. Um, the second part is about proper product information and disclosures. This is an area that's very important for regulators. So I know there's some people in the room who are from central banks or other regulatory entities. And, and the, the clear role for a regulatory body, or one of the clear roles, is very much about helping there be better information for consumers about what the products are. What are their prices? And, and how do we distill this to consumers in a way that they, that they understand? Um, the third is a term called financial capability, the third aspect of what we mean by financial inclusion. And financial capability is about making sure that, that individuals' financial needs can be met by the products and the information they have. And, and what that means is not, you know, a lot of times people, this is a little bit of a, out, a byproduct of of a, of a big push that, we, that we've that we seen in the past on financial literacy. Um, and the idea of financial literacy is that with better knowledge about finances, people can make better decisions. But the evidence on that is actually very weak, that, that, by, that you can actually teach people things through basic financial literacy programs and that it changes behavior. And there's been very little evidence to support that. The movement for financial capability recognizes that gap and says, wait a second, let's not worry so much about knowledge. Let's worry about behavior, let's, and let's worry about how people are able to use information and products to achieve basic financial goals, and that's the heart of what financial capability is. Um, so why care about financial inclusion? In a sense, finance and financial inclusion is, in a, in a very direct way, we should think of it as a means to an end, and we should always remember that, that it is not the end goal. It is simply the way that we get other things done in life. And think to your own life about how you use finance to achieve, achieve other things. You use it for insurance. You, you buy insurance products. And if you're sick, you then have some coverage. Um, you use it to, to take income that you have today and put it aside so that you can buy things later. Or you use it to buy things now with future income. It, it's, you're not taking out a loan or you're not saving for the sake of saving. You're doing it because the timing of when you receive money is not always the same as the timing in which you want to spend that money. And finance is only about helping to be the bridge between when you want to have money and when you want to spend money. Or I'm sorry, when you have money and when you want to spend money. And that's the heart of what financial inclusion is about. And there's many different areas of our life where we can see that this can make a huge difference. So, for instance, if we're a farmer, we have irregular and potentially very seasonal income, and we're very vulnerable to shocks, and finance can help 
address that problem. Um, finance can help us if we do want to, um, if, we, if we want to buy, spend money on a new roof, and we want to be able to take a little bit of all of our income over the next two years to pay for that roof, finance helps us do that. Um, so, so there's many different areas of life that frankly we all probably take for granted. And the key, the heart is, of this problem is that for people who are poor, they can't take this for granted. And we need to design better products and processes to help them um, have the same ability to, in a sense, ignore finance that, that many of us do. Um, and by us, I just mean you know people who are middle class and up, who have access to financial services and don't don't necessarily um, have to struggle and think hard about um, about um, you know where they can store money and how they can get immediate access to to cash for an extra week. So the the problem is is very stark when we between um, tranches of income and where people are in terms of access to financial services. Um, we see that 77% um, of adults living on less than $2 a day report not having an account at a formal financial institution. That is a striking gap um, in terms of access to a basic, basic account, or an ability to store, um, store money. Um, so, you know, here's a graph that shows the, the proportion of households Across, across the world and how stark the financial exclusion problem is across the world. And so as you can see in Latin America, um, the, you know, there's no country, even the wealthiest country in, in South America is not on par with Europe, Australia, and the United States. Um, you know, luckily, the, the problem is not as stark as some areas in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, but is still quite, quite stark, the, the gap between um, households. The next graph shows us this gap even more clearly. So this is basically showing us the difference in access to finance, access to a basic finance, uh, a financial account between high income households where there's 90% of households with a financial account versus low income all the way down at 22%. So in a sense, this graph is intuitive, right? This should not shock anybody in this room, um, but hopefully it can motivate us to action though. What are the barriers, right? It's one thing to say, okay, great, there's this big gap. What, what exactly is causing this gap? There's, there's a, you know, oftentimes people put forward a very simple hypothesis, but the evidence doesn't support it, which is that the gap is there because people are poor. That's really not that simple. Uh, there, there still is demand for small accounts, even for the poor, even if they're earning very little money. So let's think about what some of the barriers are when we dig down a little bit deeper. From the sub saver side, for demand, there are gaps that are in information and knowledge where people don't have the right information about bank accounts. There's lack of trust, lack of tr trust in financial institutions. Some of this might actually be appropriate if there's risk the banks are not, are, in terms of the sovereignty of the banks, but some of it is probably misplaced, um, misplaced fears. There's other demands on money, particularly in, the informal, in, in informal economies. There's a lot more demand from neighbors and cousins. Um, to take it to an extreme, you know, on a personal level, I don't remember the last time a neighbor came to my house in middle class America, upper, upper middle class America, and knocked on my door and asked me for a loan. Um, but actually, in, in a rural village, this is actually a very common occurrence, that there's that type of demand on money. So a lot of times, that is actually taking money that would be normally held into a bank account and is um, lending it out within, within the market. There are very high transaction costs for, for the poor. Um, if the bank, this is one of the things that's actually very exciting about the world of mobile money is radically changing transaction costs, but it is historically a big wedge that creates a big market failure. The fact that you have to go to a bank and make a deposit is, is if the deposit is very small, simply makes no sense. Um, social constraints refer to the demand on money. Um, Lastly, there's behavioral biases. I'm going to spend a fair amount of time on behavioral biases. These plague rich and poor alike. We see this, we've done work in the United States on, on what we would, what most people should consider fairly wealthy households that find that people are not saving enough for retirement relative to what they think they should be saving in a moment of reflection. And, and, um, and, and that's true of the poor as well. And so we're going to talk about a series of products 
that are designed around helping the poor overcome behavioral biases that lead them to undersave. On the supplier side, there are also important barriers. On the regulatory side, corruption and leakage, as well as just um, profitability and, and work that needs to be done to help bring, bring costs down. That's particularly true for lenders, for instance, which are helping an example of an area that we're working a lot on is helping lenders use big data better to help bring their costs down for borrowing, for lending. Okay, so we're going to dig in on five constraints here. Um, behavioral biases, information and knowledge gaps, high transaction costs, lack of trust in regulatory barriers, and social constraints. In a sense, too, I want to the big picture way of explaining why, you know, the way, why we think in terms of barriers like this. We are all working in some, some facet of a, either a regulatory body, policymakers, researchers, and we're all, if the market were working perfectly, we probably none of us would have the job we have. We would just be sitting back going, isn't this a wonderful world, markets work. The interesting work that we're all facing is figuring out, no, actually markets are not working quite so perfectly. There are failures. What are they? And how can we make those failures less? How can we reduce some of the gaps between the perfect market solution and the reality? And that's where the exciting innovation is. Regulatory policy plays a role. And these five barriers are all different wedges that create a gap, a wedge, between a perfect market outcome and the reality. Um, and, and so all of these ideas are all motivated by first saying, understanding where that market failure is and the source of it, and then trying to come up with a solution that helps reduce that market failure. Um, okay, so some of the key findings that we're going to highlight on um, behavioral biases are, I'm going to focus on the first two on this list, time and consistent preferences and costly self-control. And second is inattention. When we talk about time and consistent preferences, simply put, what we're talking about is the idea that, that money can be hot. Money can burn. Lots of Every country has its own expression for this. Money burns a hole in your pocket is another very common expression I've heard translated in many languages. The basic idea that if something is too far away in the future, that we might put too little weight on it relative to what we actually say we want to do if we're in a moment of reflection. And that things that are right now get exciting and we're tempted and, and we go and we buy it. And then we later regret it. But we do this over and over and over again. And when it comes time to need the money for that long-term thing, we often find ourselves without the money. So there's a series of products that are designed around helping to overcome that. A second is inattention. Um, inattention can be about a not attending to the task of saving. I just, I meant to do it today and I forgot, I'll do it tomorrow, tomorrow happens, I forgot, I don't do it, I don't do it the next day. And then that money ends up in my pocket getting spent rather than saved. It could be about forgetting about future expenses. You ask me my future income and maybe I can add it up very nicely and easily because I only have two sources of income. You ask me about all my future expenses, that's a long list, and I forget stuff. Now when I'm thinking about how much I need to save, if I remember all my income, but I'm only remembering some of my expenses, I might actually think I'm doing better off than I really am. And, and so I end up spending more and not saving enough because I forgot about some of the future things I need to be putting money aside for. Um, so some of the products that we've tested are directly addressing some of these things. Um, so let me start with one example from Afghanistan that gets at one of the kind of the, the, the most classic way of dealing of helping a product be designed around human behavior. And it, it's basically about changing the default. One of the, one, of the, one of the basic rules of behavioral economics is that you want to make it easy for people to do the thing that they would say they want to do in a moment of reflection. Um, another way of saying that is inertia rules. That if people, if you can set up a process so that the the no action option is actually what people want, then you know people are lazy and they won't change their mind and they won't change the behavior and they won't and then, and then it just happens. And so this was a very simple case of a phone based savings account with an automatic payroll deduction, and the automatic payroll deduction people were able to automatically make it so that money goes into savings, and 
And so then when the future payroll came, the money automatically went and voila, they saved more. This is just you know, kind of behavioral economics 101 applied to savings. And it created such an increase in savings that it was the same as matching 50% of contributions. So think about that as a, as a, you know, if you're trying to motivate people to save more because you have some goal of doing this from an employer perspective or a public policy perspective, you have two choices. Both get you the same outcome. One is much more expensive than the other. One is let's match their savings so that we can give them incentives to save more by matching at a 50% rate. The other is let's give them the ability to just make it so that this is what happens unless they change their mind. And it's amazing that you get the same result from both. It's intuitive, but it's a very strong result. Um, and so when there are ways of helping people set up the automated action, it is a no, absolute no-brainer that's the, the best thing to be doing. Um, so along with that, in a lot of situations we've seen, it's, there isn't a way of automating. A lot of people live in the informal economy. And so you can't just say, oh, we'll take 10% out of your paycheck and move it into savings. That's, that's, a, that's a luxurious solution for the, for the salaried people of the world. Um, for the rest of the world, other devices are often needed to think through. So there's a world of commitment savings products that we've taken, um, done a lot of different work on. And there's many different things that, it, that we mean by a commitment savings. A commitment savings can be a commitment to deposit, just like the, the default study from Afghanistan is a form of commitment. That is a type of commitment savings account. It's one that works very well because it's with salaried individuals. Um, Sometimes there's a range that we put on the spectrum from soft to hard. But basically when you have a commitment account, what we mean is you are either making some sort of commitment to deposit or some sort of commitment to not withdraw. But that commitment can be strong or it can be weak. A soft commitment might be simply labeling the account and saying this is my education account. So that's a soft commitment. Why? Well, I can take the money out and use it for whatever I want. There's no explicit enforcement or penalty. But the reality is, just merely having that label, it does actually influence me because I'm increasing the price of deviating because I'd be disappointed with myself. There's a psychic cost. A hard commitment, on the other hand, might actually make it so that, no, you have to take the money out of the account and send it to a school. So that's a very hard commitment. That's the other end of the spectrum where you put that money in and it is locked in. It will be used for school or it is locked in and it will get used at the agriculture store to buy fertilizer. So it's a hard commitment. Um, so we've studied commitment savings in many, many parts of the world. Six countries um, in particular we're highlighting. Philippines, Kenya, Malawi, Uganda, Ghana, and Bolivia. And what we've seen from these accounts, like I said, in a myriad of different ways that they were tested, we do find increased savings levels, increased investment in health, education, and durable goods. And we also find increased power for women in the household in, um, from the Philippine study. Um, so one question you might want to ask is, you know, I just gave you the spectrum of strong and weak commitments. Well, what's better? So there's, of course, never a, a very simple universal answer to this. But here we put together a very simple um, table or graph that shows them on a spectrum from stronger commitment features on the left to weaker on the right with a very simple metric of take up and usage of accounts. So the blue bar is just taking up the account saying yes, and the red bar has, is, is a metric of how much they were using the account. And roughly speaking, what you can see here is an upside down U. Right? And what you can see is that if it's too weak, it doesn't work well. If it's too strong, it doesn't work as well. <coughs> and something in the middle might actually be um, typically optimal. Of course, I don't want to oversell the middle as somehow the magic option. Um, the, you know, the one real lesson from this is that context matters. And you can get very different answers. There's lots of different ways of making it work. And we've seen different, many different iterations where it's successful, some more successful than others. And in any new setting, we need to think through, well, what are the problems that we're actually trying to tackle? What are the types of things people are saving, saving for? And that, that should lead to some prescriptive answer, um, or at the very least, a set of prescriptive answers that can then be tested in that context. Um, the second behavioral bias that uh, that we are very that a lot of people are focused on, including ourselves, has to do with attention. And this is where we've done a series of tests about reminders, reminding people about their about their um, desire to save and their future expenditures. 
So we started this study in Peru um, and, and then expanded it to Bolivia and then expanded from there to the Philippines. And here, what we did was very, very simple. We sent people a reminder. People had set up an account where they said they wanted to save, put in a deposit once a month. And then we simply randomized whether or not people received messages reminding them about their savings or not. And we find that um, sending any type of reminder increased the likelihood of reaching their goal by five percentage points. Um, in Peru, we increased savings balances by 13%, in Bolivia by 11%. And these are, in a sense, small amounts, but they're big compared to the cost of sending messages, which is just a simple text, um, the cost of a text. And, and both can be done actually at really low prices. So these are, what we learned from here was some really important lessons about how attention is actually a driving barrier. It's not gonna radically change the world. We're not gonna solve poverty problems by sending some text messages. But for the cost of doing them, we can actually see some noticeable impact. Um, we've now been working in, in other parts of the world. Um, we're replicating these, these messaging studies in eight countries. One of the, one of the obvious points to remember is that it's, we're not going to come up with the, the magic single text message that needs to be sent throughout the world and then boom, everybody saves more. That we need to understand more about what types of messages work, how to time them, when, you know, when to send them, what time of day, how often. Um, what to say in them, how well to customize them. And so after we did those first three studies and found the success we did, we embarked on an effort to expand this to as many places as we can to build this method of testing messaging into the ecosystem and the DNA of, a, of financial institutions. And so we're still, we're still looking, we're, still, we're working on eight different countries and we're still expanding this. So actually this is an area where um, everybody in this, in this, um, in this webinar, if, if you have connections or ideas for us, financial institutions or regulators that you think would be interested in setting up text messaging campaigns, reaching out to people, helping them, um, reminding them about goals, reminding them about their savings desires, um, we are, um, we are you know, quite eager to expand this um, effort as much as we can, and we do have, um, we do have financing um, for, um, for, the, for the effort. So the second area I want to talk about is information and knowledge gaps. Um, and, um, and here there's kind of two parts to this, knowledge of financial concepts and then awareness and understanding of available products. So the evidence on financial education is mixed, I think, is if anything, a generous term for it. For the most part, what we often refer to as chalk and talk programs, programs which are going after particularly adults with kind of formalized training, tend to, um, at, at, we, we tend to see very little impact from these types of, of programs. And, um, and there's, there is strong evidence to suggest that very short, simple targeted trainings might be more effective, um, ones that just deliver very specific, for instance, rules of thumb. Is a very specific thing. Do the following. If you're running a small enterprise, keep your money separate between your house and your and your office. And your, and your office. I'm sorry, your micro enterprise. So sh very short, simple, targeted training might be much more effective in, in helping people manage cash better and making better decisions. Um, it, while it, you know, I think the most important thing to remember is that while it's true that if you do a survey of financial education, you will find that wealthier people are, have more financial education. That does not mean that teaching somebody about financial education will make them wealthier. Um, and we need to focus much more on behaviors and choices that people are making rather than making sure they know how to calculate interest rates and things like that. Um, also, product disclosures don't always work as intended. Um, Many audits, uh, we've seen audit studies that show that staff, um, staff, staff themselves do not always disclose product information accurately. And not in a nefarious way, but just because they, they themselves don't have the, the training and expertise to know their product and how it compares to, to competitors, et cetera. Um, and, um, and we've seen many different disclosure policies from countries that, for instance, um, require that that interest rates are explained in ways that consumers don't understand. And, and you know, the analogy I often use for this, I'm not sure if this will um, translate very well, but it, it's kind of like telling Americans how obese they are by giving us our weight in stones. 
bones is a British metric for weight. I'm not sure what it translates to, something like 14 pounds or six kilos. But needless to say, most Americans don't even know that a stone is a unit of measure. And so telling people their weight in stone is not going to change behavior. It's just going to confuse people. Similar point with interest rates. If you tell people interest rates and you're trying to, as a regulator, make it so that, that um, everybody is adhering to some common standard, but that that's not the standard that consumers know, that's not going to be effective in helping consumers make better choices. Um, so let me go through a couple examples of some specific projects. The first one is about personalizing pension info in information in Chile. So these were used, and these photos show you exactly what the treatment was. It was these little these little kiosks. Um, and um, and here the um, the the key here is that people were given concrete, very very specific, personalized information about pension payouts that they're going to receive. And the question, and through these through these terminals, and the question is, what does this do for for their voluntary contributions if they have that kind of very clear information about what their retirement setup is? And the answer is that it does lead to increase in voluntary contributions. Um, and 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 what you know what's nice about this is you know you could easily imagine a world in which giving someone that kind of information has no effect because some people overestimate and some people underestimate and so on average it doesn't change. <clears throat> but what we do see here is that people for the most part were underestimating and the people who underestimated the most were exactly the people who adjusted the most and and their their voluntary savings went up even more. Um, and um, a second thing that's very important to know is that you know, whenever we see a program that helps people save more in one dimension, we always want to be able to figure out something about where the money comes from. Because we, we really want to just increase saving if all that's happening is we're moving money from one pocket to another pocket, but the, the products are not really any different. So we might get this false illusion that we've had a nice impact on savings, when in fact all we've done is move money from one pocket to another pocket. And so here for this pension program, they were able to look at alternative savings channels and see and did not find any evidence that the money came from alternative savings, which means that the money did actually come out of consumption, which if somebody was under saving in terms of fulfilling their retirement goals, that's exactly where you want to see the money coming from. You want to see that they are consuming less in order to, um, in order to save more. Um, so a, another study was done in Mexico <clears throat> that was on disclosure policy, and this tells some, some striking results. So this is an audit study done in Mexico and Peru, um, and it showed that the financial provider staff tended to provide incomplete or inaccurate information. Um, and, and this was even more so for shoppers who, who came in appearing inexperienced. Um, one, you know, this type of audit study is actually a, a potentially very important role for regulators to understand. There's a big often divide between what a bank is doing on paper and what's actually happening in practice. And I don't mean this in a nefarious way, a bad way. This is just the natural byproduct of operating a business at scale. That you can have your policies, but then if the policies depend on humans to explain them to people, then the entire thrust of how a policy is going to play out is going to rely on the training of those staff. And, and at scale, that can, that can not have the same um, quality implementation that is, that is assumed in the design of a program. Um, and so audit studies of this nature that help understand how much information does staff actually even have about products and how well informed are they and how well are they explaining it to shoppers can be a very, very important role um, for regulators to play to help make sure that people are, um, are being given appropriate information. And when there's a problem there that it tells you that you might either want to have better, um, better efforts training your staff, or just that the disclosure policies need to be built in a more transparent way, um, that they are, very, they are difficult to do, um, but that more work needs to be done to understand how to design better disclosure policies. Um, so um, 
An example of this comes from Mexico. Here, low-income in, low individuals tested several types of disclosure forms. So we have variations in which consumers were given either five or ten product options, or simple or complex information about each product option. And then they're asked to choose. And the question we want to know is, do they choose well? And how is that influenced by how many choices they're given and how complex the options are? So here you can see there's five different products and a whole bunch of different features are provided about them. In another example, we have 10 different products that they're given, but much less information about each. So it's a, it's a two by two kind of um, lab setup where then consumers are being asked what, what, what um, is up here. I mean, what, which product they would choose. Sorry, I'm having a hard time reading my own graph here. It's because I'm all I'm pulling it up here. Um, so now, what do we see here? Um, as you can see, the red bar, which is the five simple options, is always um, the one that has the most in terms of the percentage of people that choose the best product. Right? So this is, in some sense, this is a very intuitive result, but it's, a, it's important to actually document this, and this type of process can help hone in on how to do this best. So giving people fewer choices rather than more made it more likely that they chose the best product. But it also, there is too much, when too much was provided, people had a hard time figuring out which of the products was actually the better product. And the way this was designed, just to be clear, is there was a product that kind of stood out as the best product. Um, and so, you know, one, one punchline from this is very straightforward, which is disclosure policy is not just, hey, make it more transparent. That's not what good disclosure policy is. Disclosure policy has to figure out how to present the data to consumers better so that they can make the best choice possible. And giving them too much information might actually be um, not, you know, might not actually help get them to the, to the right answer. It might be too much information, it might be too complicated. Um, and so that, that's a trade-off which needs to be figured out market by market, understanding the different choices. Um, the last one I want to share with you is, a, is from a, on this topic is a study from Turkey. So in Turkey, there is a large market for overdraft. This is a very common we're seeing in lots of middle market countries. So I'm guessing this is re very relevant in a lot of uh, um, a lot of Latin American countries. So a um, the overdraft works where people do have a, a normal current account, checking account. Um, but if they overdraft, the bank gives them an automatic loan, one that they don't have to ask for. It just happens automatically, and and then then they can pay it back in, with some sort of payback period. Um, the interest rate on these can be sometimes fairly high. In Turkey, it was around 60% APR. And what we found here was very striking. We worked with this bank sending people messages about their account. And we wanted to see how these messages influenced whether people, how people use the account. And we had a few different messages, but basically I'm going to tell you about two. One just reminded people about the account. I said, hey, you have this account. When you sent people that message, they used the account more. So there was something about not even really fully being aware of it that people got these messages and they said, oh, I forgot I can have this account and use it. Um, the other striking thing is we also sent out messages for some people and we gave them a 50% discount on their interest. We told them, you, we were, we're going to give you back half of the interest on your, on your loan from the overdraft um, if you use this account. When we, when we gave back half of the interest, what happened is people used the account less. So I, just in case you weren't following that, it said it, the, I, you know, it said it the opposite way that you might have expected. Right? If you go to a store and you see something on sale for 50% off, you expect people to buy more of it. Here, we dropped the price by half and we saw people use less of it. What does that tell us? Well, one really important lesson is people didn't quite realize what the price was in the first place. When, we, when the bank gave back half the interest, to a lot of people, what this caused is an aha moment. It was, oh, this must be expensive. You just gave me back half the interest. How much was I paying? It must have been high. I'm not going to use this anymore. I didn't realize it was so expensive that you're willing to give me half my money back. 
So that, you know, that is one interpretation. One thing that's interesting is in the long run, we see this effect go away when people went back to using the account again. So maybe in the long run, it actually wasn't that expensive and it just felt, it just sounded expensive, but in the long run, they realized actually it gave them lots of flexibility in life and they kind of liked that flexibility. So they went back. Um, further experimentation and testing can help, help understand some of those mechanisms. But one important lesson that we get from this is that people did not know about the, people did, were not fully informed about the price and things that push out more disclosure and transparency in pricing clearly um, could help that market work better and make sure that consumers are making um, good choices for themselves. The third barrier is high transaction costs. This is where we're seeing mobile money really just change the landscape radically. Radical changes in the way financial inclusion is, is being done today than it was just even a, even a couple years ago because of the reduction in transaction costs that come from mobile money. Um, so here's a very simple graph that shows the the shows what happened with one simple cost, which is distance to a bank. And you can see the impact on this. This is the same set of studies that I showed you on the commitment savings. And here, what we're looking at is increasing distance from, to the bank from left to right. So these are studies um, all the way on the left in which the bank was right in the village where people were right at their market. So they basically had almost zero distance to the bank, all the way to the right where, where people had to travel 15 minutes to an hour to get to the bank and make a deposit. And as you can see, you see this downward sloping curve. So as we increase distance, we see less and less usage of accounts. Very intuitive result, um, basically making the point that near access to a bank is, is in, in terms of transaction costs is important. Now let's remember, that doesn't mean we need to go and put bank branches in, in highly rural areas in the Amazon, but that's the beauty of mobile money, is that it's going to help us make it so that people's transaction costs are, can be, can be um, next to nothing. Um, so, a key, a key policy lesson, um, hold on a second, sorry. Um, so what are, so bring us back to the, the big picture. What are some of the key policy lessons from all this? The first is that if we if we think through what are the barriers to savings and to and to good decisions on credit and good decisions on payments, if we think through what are some of those barriers, it leads to some direct prescriptions. If we know the barriers have to do with attention or time and consistent preferences, that tells us specifically about product help. If we know the barriers about transaction costs, we know that mobile money can help with the general So thinking of what the barriers are. It gives us direct ideas for what type of policies are or products are that we want to see expanded. Um, a second key policy lesson is that the key to improving take up and usage lie large, uh, to a large extent in the product design and the cost. Everybody's needs are different. It's not going to be a one product fit all solution to financial inclusion. But we do need to um, think through how we can make products flexible, how we can make products serve more than, more than one type of person, more than one type of need, and how do, how do we build that into the way products are offered so that a farmer can use it for their purposes in the same way someone else can use a, a product to save up for school fees, as an example. Um, so what are some of the things that policymakers and financial service providers can do the first is leveraging transaction data. There's a tremendous amount of information and data that we now have access to, not we personally, but the world has access to, and institutions and regulators have access to, that just a few years ago we didn't have access to, and that can really make, be used to help improve the market. So for instance, <clears throat> using, using better data so that, so that one can do risk-based pricing for lending can really help improve credit markets for the poor. So they can get access to affordable loans, um, loans that are lower cost because, because the institutions have better information about the risk of individuals. Um, the second area that there's a lot of room for progress is to test out new product designs. Um, integrating, a lot, of, a, a lot of decisions get made whenever someone is launching a new product. And it's always striking to me 
how often there's key debates going on and the test is not being put in place to help them answer these questions. Just before this webinar, I was on the phone with a lender in Africa who's looking at um, who's looking at making, it's a, a, a non-bank lender that's looking to um, expand consumer credit in Sub-Saharan Africa. And they have an interest rate they were going to charge. And they asked what I thought about it. And I told them, well, I think you should lower it. Um, I did that because I want to see the interest rates come down and I think they have too much profit in what they were, what they were doing. But they said, oh, but we don't think, we don't think it matters. We think, we think people are happy to pay this just, and we don't think it'll have increased demand. And I asked them, well, what makes you think that? And they said, oh, well, we did a, we did some focus groups. And, and, and people named other dimensions of the loan that mattered to them as well. That's not evidence. There's, that is not evidence to, that should allow them to say, this is the optimal price, even from a pure business perspective. We did a study in, in, with Comportamos Banco in Mexico, across the entire country of Mexico, at the branch level, Comportamos randomized the interest rate on their loans. And we found that lowering the interest rate on their loans actually increased their profits, that it brought in so many more clients, the drop in interest rates, that it actually increased profits. Um, they've since lowered the interest rate. It wasn't a massive change, it was, but it was a 10 percentage point change in interest rates. Um, they've since implemented the lower interest rate throughout the, throughout the um, throughout their lending. That's the type of test that can, uh, that's actually a large scale test, but obviously for, uh, for early stage of a product, these things can be built in earlier on. The, the messaging that we talked about, this is exactly the type of thing that a financial institution can build in quick, low cost, iterative testing. It can just be rapid fire, send out a bunch of messages, find out immediately is it getting people to save, move on to some other messages, test those, and a lot of the questions that are being asked are immediate answer questions. Some of them are not. Some of them might be about what happens to long run behavior, and that's fine. But there's a lot of things out there where the question is immediately answerable by just seeing. If you send out the following message, do people save? Do people make their loan payment more? Do people borrow more, et cetera? The third area where there's clear room for more work and collaboration between policymakers and financial service providers lies with disclosure policy. Um, we are, I think, uh, strikingly void of the evidence that we need from the regulatory process to know how to get consumers information that is both good information, accurate information, and explained in a way that they can use. And if this is done better, regulators will have, uh, be achieving their mission of helping consumers make good choices, and frankly, banks will be better off too because they will end up with better informed consumers who are more loyal to them um, and making wiser choices. And you know, even a bank does not want someone to borrow in an unhealthy way. That's not a good long-term client. And so, so this is an area where there's clear benefits um, and gains from trade for collaboration between financial service providers and, and regulators. Um, so with that, I will, um, I, I will close. And we can shift into Q and A. I hope that was a helpful way of getting the getting the questions going. Um, okay, so thank you very much, Dean. Uh, now we open the floor for questions. Uh, I would like to remind you to feel free to ask questions either by raising your hand or writing a chat message. Okay, so I'm going to ask. Uh, do behavioral biases, in your experience, do behavioral biases change from country to country or from region to region? Um, they change, I would say behavioral biases change in the way they manifest themselves, but most behavioral biases, the way described, are actually fairly universal. But that doesn't mean that, for instance, you know, one person might be lack attention, another person might be time inconsistent. Um, I might be time inconsistent regarding regarding savings, but I might be perfectly rational regarding eating dessert. Um, for what it's worth, that's not true. It's the other way around. I'm good at saving. I'm not good about dessert. 
Um, so everybody might have their own bias and their own, own quirk um, to answer across people. So, you know, to answer your question, are, I, there aren't actually good data that say, ah, in El Salvador, it's 60% this and 30% that and 20% do this, whereas in the Philippines, it's the proportions are different. No doubt there are going to be some differences like that. Um, but I would say the striking thing is that, you know, I've never worked in a country in the world that is just void of a particular behavioral bias, where it's like, oh, we don't have that problem here. Um, this is just human nature. We, we all have these problems. They manifest themselves differently across us. Um, but it's not, it's not something where there's some country that is just magically void of problems of time and consistency. Okay, thank you. There, there are a lot of questions in the chat window. I'm trying to expand this window. Hold on. Can I expand the window? The first one said, Hi, Dr. Carlan. Could you open the experience of Honduras? I'm not. Is that? I've, I've only done one. I didn't. Hmm, I'm not clear what the question is on. I've done one study in Honduras, but I didn't talk about it here, so I'm not sure if you're if you just know about my study from Honduras and you're asking that, or if you're, um, um, or if you're asking something totally different. Can you can you clarify that? And meanwhile, I'll move on to the next question. Okay. Um, this is hard to this is very hard to see in this little window because it's like three lines. I'm, I'm, I'm going to move a little bit the templates so that perhaps you, you will be able to see them better. Let me see. Excellent, this window. Ooh, there we go. Okay. I'm old, too. I'm sitting on this. Um, Uh, it would be nice to have all of these experiments done in other countries, but many times surveys are the only thing available to study financial inclusion. What is your opinion about household reported data from surveys? So I think it's important to remember that experiments and surveys are not, it's not one or the other. And, you know, not all questions are, need an experiment, and not all questions need surveys. It is the case that self-reported data on surveys can um, be very useful for a lot of questions, and for others less so. So there's no general, general answer to that. Um, we always, as researchers, we always like, when we can, to use administrative data from credit bureaus or from banks because of the accuracy of them. Um, but there's a lot of contexts in which you're asking a question which is, um, has to be a survey question. It's about um, how people value um, consumption. It's about what people are predicting they're going to need in the future, things like that. So there's lots of, there's lots of reasons to be doing surveys. Um, they are more expensive to do. So a very important kind of obvious point is that if one is on a limited budget, it's, um, there's a lot more that you can do on a limited budget by sending, um, by using administrative data to measure outcomes from, a, from, a, from an experiment than from doing surveys. Um, are you studying any other cost-efficient mechanism that account for inattention and low self-improvement? Um, not sure what that means. Um, so, you know, other than, um, I think the short answer is no. I mean, the, the, what we're using to, to look at an inattention issues, um, well, I mean, I guess, I, I it's a bit broader than this, but what I we have done a series of tests on what are called savings groups, which are, which have been done a lot in different parts of Latin America as well. And a savings group is a group of informal women who come together and save, um, and and they put money into a pot, and one woman then gets the pot each week. Different rules, different ways of doing it have different rules. So we've done four randomized trials on this, all in Africa, and we found that they did have big effects on, um, on consumption smoothing, on helping, helping women absorb shocks. And one of the reasons why we think these work is because of inattention, and it does work well in a low cell phone area, but there's other reasons why these things work too. I, don't want, I want to be clear. I would not describe savings groups as an attention, as directly addressing um, only the attention barrier to savings, because it's also creating a social bond, a, a commitment device to help people save more. Um, 
one striking result from the National Survey in Mexico is not only a high proportion of people don't save at all, but that a very high proportion of respondents who don't save say they don't do so because they don't have enough um, no le alcanza. How prevalent in developing countries is this belief perception truth that people don't have enough and that's why they don't save? And in your view, would you say that in general this is a more of a behavioral issue? Thank you. Okay, so I would summarize this in a very simple way, and it's um, which is, um, um, you know, that asking somebody, it's like asking, you know, if we if we were in a room, I've done this before when we were in a room, this is not going to work as well in a webinar, but imagine I asked everybody right now to raise your hand if you'd like to have more savings. I think everybody is going to raise their hand. So in a sense, a question which says pe asks people, um, why aren't you saving more, an answer of no le alcanza is not a very helpful answer. Um, it's reality, it's what people say, but it doesn't actually give us any guidance, because of course just people want more money. And that's not a bad, that's just reality. Um, so the key that we want to ask is, given the income you have, are you making the decision that's optimal for you or not? And that's a very different question. And that's where even someone who's very poor, you know, everything's going to be scaled down. It's going to be smaller numbers, but they still, in many situations, do want to save more. But that's where transaction costs can get in the way. Um, and behavioral biases. Behavioral biases apply to everybody, but the transaction costs are very disproportionately hitting the poor. And that's why mobile money, I think, has big promise here. Um, um, do you have identified some specific regulatory legal barriers in the region? Um, so I, I do think that disclosure policy is a very important regulatory barrier that is important to tackle better. That there's lack of information on, lack of knowledge on how to do this well. I'm not saying I have the answer to be clear. I'm not saying, but, but, you know, but I think there's, there are processes to put in place to help understand how different regulatory transparency rules, disclosure policies, information that people have to get when they take out a loan or, or, or thinking about savings, or just even public ways of, of announcing options to people public <laughs> <coughs> publicly that can be mandated through a regulator could might have a really important um, influence on choices people make, but we need more research to know how to do that best. I'll, I'll never forget when I was much younger seeing the South African regulatory body requiring interest rates be presented in a way that they found was, they believed was the most transparent way possible, which is a, a particular calculation. This calculation was not how consumers thought about interest rates. And I remember looking at this disclosure policy and thinking this is, is going to be absolutely useless because you're requiring banks explain interest rates in a way that people don't use. They don't use that method of calculating interest rates. So telling them the that they have to disclose it in a way they don't understand is just a, a nice way of getting them to ignore the information altogether. So we need to understand how people think about interest rates and make the information conform to them rather than thinking that we can change the world and change the way people think about interest rates. Um, in your studies in different areas, have you found that some financial products work better for women than for men? Is there a gender gap in tendency to save? Um, you know, this is an area which I think is very different. There's no doubt there's a lot of differences in, in the gender gap across countries, a lot of different norms. Um, you know, in the Philippines, for instance, it's a very common norm that women are the ones controlling household finances more. Um, we have had, we did find that the commitment savings accounts in the Philippines had a big impact on female power. Um, there is a product in Kenya that was tested that found that women were more likely to use the um, use access to a savings account to help make investments in their microenterprise, whereas men were not doing it um, for the same in the same way, didn't have the same positive benefits. So we have seen some, but it's but most studies, for what it's worth, are not set up to test that. I think is one reality. So we have a hodgepodge of little pieces of evidence, but we certainly do not have a very consistent answer across the world about the way to design products differently for men versus women. Um, when it comes to implementing financial literacy strategies, what kind of knowledge works best to generate savings? So I, I'm actually not sure that the, that, the, I, I think I, 
want to change the question and to be, is there anything in that world that works and that increases knowledge? And I'm not sure there is. Um, there's very little that's been done on financial literacy that has found good long-term benefits. A little bit here and there, but very many more of the studies are finding no effect than, than positive effect um, when it's knowledge-based. Now, when it's action-based, behavior-based, that's where we think there might be some, some action. It's, so it's not teaching knowledge. It's just saying, here is something to do. Do the following. Open an account, save once a month. Very simple rule. That's not knowledge in that. That's not teaching about accounts and teaching interest rates and um, helping people do budgets and things like this. It's just giving very clear rule of thumb. Here's a behavior that you can do and it can lead to good things. Boom. Um, the lack of trust in financial institutions seems an important barrier. How can we promote trust in developing countries? I always hate that question <laughs> because I have no answer um, that is evidence-based, certainly. Um, it is an important question. Um, I don't hate it because it's bad. It's a very good question. It's a very important question. Um, I, and I do not, I have not seen very many studies which said, okay, here's a bank which should be trusted and is not. How can we improve that trust? Um, so my, my only tangible answer to it is that this is, and it is a bit outside of the area in which I research. Most of my research is very focused on consumer behavior. There's no doubt that a strong regulatory process to make sure, to help banks not go under is, at, is critical, right? If, the, the, if, the, if there are banks that are um, insolvent and are, and, are, um, and are actually going under, then it's very sensible for people to not trust banks, right? That's actually quite rational. So the first order thing to do is to make sure that there's good regulatory process in place so that banks are a safe place for people to put their savings. How you actually get people to understand that if the banks are safe is a separate matter. Um, and that's, that's one where we actually have not seen much um, research on that that I'm, that I'm familiar with, at least, that um, sheds light. I do think it's important to tackle. Um, I'm reading this question from Angelica. Um, Oop. I it just cleared the message. I was I have no message anymore. That the chat history has been cleared. And a okay. Okay, you got about savings to this corner, but I was wondering if you were able to identify some barrier to financial inclusion. Um, also, the sex message from an increase of say clients that have the echo Um I'm not actually sure what you're asking. I'm sorry. Um, um, I mean, all I can tell you, I mean, that particular project, for what it's worth, it didn't, that's all it was doing, was working with the Echo Aguinaldo product um, to help people save more within the context of that actual product. So we didn't look at any other, um, that, 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 that's all that project was doing. So there, there was, I don't have any other information for you about the other, other aspects in the Bolivian market from that, from that time that I studied. Um, crowdfunding. You mean crowd? Um, if this is referring to like crowdfunding from the United States, like like models like Kiva, um, 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 my general. I, I don't um, have much of an opinion on it, other than to say if it lowers the cost of funds, then great. Um, and so if it helps improve what a market failure between households in, in wealthier countries that want to invest in lending markets and in, in growing emerging markets, then, then this is a good thing. So any, any effort that helps push that forward, um, we should be excited about. Um, Uh, 
um, how can policymakers increase the incentive of banking the poor for commercial banks? Um, so I don't know that it's um, that is. So I don't, you know, not through like any sort of direct subsidy. I think the key here is to lower the regulatory barriers. Um, so things like know your customer laws, which are, if they are, prove if they're costly to implement, are barriers to, to the poor and are and and cause harm. So that's a clear area where a policymaker can reduce the disincentive of banking to the poor, um, which is a little bit different than increasing the incentive, but it's the same basic thing. So that's, I think, one of the main things I would say to examine is making sure that the transaction costs for the bank are as low as humanly possible. Um, um, okay, have um, savings groups um, committing to a specific investment, household solar units. Um, I don't think I've seen anything like that. That would be interesting um, to see that tested, but I've never, I'm not familiar with, I, nothing jumps out at me as studies that have combined informal savings groups with um, specific um, investment things. Um, uh, what can the central bank do in order to increase financial inclusion? Um, I think there's two there's two areas that I would encourage central banks to be involved in in this context, or at least that that are in my under my purview of things I see. One is, I mean, there's obviously some other things about sovereignty of banks and et cetera, but one is on disclosure policy. Um, how what are the rules that should be in place that banks need to provide consumers so that they can make informed decisions that help them choose the right product? And that's an area where a good, clean disclosure policy can go a long way to helping financial, increase financial inclusion, helping people be comfortable with the right product, that they're making the right choice, and helping them make sure that they have the right information. Um, the second is on Know Your Customer Laws, KYC. I don't, know, I don't know what the laws are in Haiti. In some countries, KYC laws get in the way of financial inclusion. They increase the cost to the bank to work with the poor, or they make it so that there are rules that make it so that the poor just will never even get access to an account. Um, uh, do behavioral biases continue to inhabit the effectiveness of suggested innovation? Ah, no, so let me explain. So think about it this way. We want to accept the beast of human nature design around it. We're not trying to change human nature, We're trying to design around it, trying to recognize that we understand that we have low attention to certain things, so let's increase that attention. Or let's make it so I don't even have to pay attention. That's the beauty of automated savings. The study from Afghanistan that I mentioned, that is embracing the beast, that embracing human nature, embracing the failures we have and saying, let's make it so that I can still be a failed person, but I'll end up saving um, because I automated my savings. So very much the strategy is not changing human nature, it's accepting human nature and figuring out how to design around it. Um, what is a good indicator method to measure the success of a financial inclusion intervention? Depends. Very simply, it depends on what, what one is trying to do. So if the goal is to increase savings, then increasing savings. If the goal is to see whether people um, borrow, you know, um, spend less money on, on loans and look at the interest rates that are paying on loans. Um, so it totally depends on what the it is that you're looking at and then, and then the metric should fall from there. Um, what do I think about the long-term effects? There's some cases where we have evidence on long-term effects. So I don't, let me, let, me, let me first answer your question more directly. What do I think about them? I don't know until I see them. So that's an absolutely important question to always ask. Are we changing long-term behavior or not? Um, it's a question that often gets asked, but not always in a lot of studies. Um, it costs money to follow over time. A lot of times there's other things that, that people want to do with a control group, for instance. Um, and so sometimes it's not possible to ask, but when it is possible to ask, it's, it's, um, it's important. Um, and there are, 
you know, you know, there's a lot of things out there where we have seen dissipation the way you would expect. So, for instance, the Philippine study that we did um, 12 years ago on commitment savings, we did find that um, the effect dissipated over time. The bank did nothing whatsoever to keep the product going, and of course, behavior kind of whittled away slowly over time. Um, the reminder study that I told you about from Turkey, we had this big short run effect on, on borrowing behavior that went away after three months. So there's definitely situations where you see changes over time, and, and the, the best answer to your question is that that uh, needs to be assessed um, kind of intervention by intervention, how important that is to know, and, and, and there's one way to answer that, which is to, to wait and see what the long-term effect is. So I, I don't think there's a universal answer to which types of costs are more or less expensive. Um, you know, we certainly one certainly can set up studies where you, um, you you test out the relative importance to a particular context of, of you know and, and get an answer to that. But it's going to be you know often very context specific. So I don't have a, a general answer to to your question, Alberto. I think there's a minimum schooling people need to be financially included. Nope. In fact, that's the entire goal of financial inclusion, I would say, is to include people irrespective of their schooling. Um, what are my thoughts on mobile account savings versus banking? So I have two basic thoughts. One is total exhilaration and the other is fear. The total exhilaration is that it lowers the cost. That it's now, you know, you don't, I don't have to go to a bank. That's great. It saves me a lot of time and hassle on the line. And, and so I'm lowering, lowering transaction costs. This makes the world a better place. My fear, because now I can access my money really easily. I could be in some store and just, you know, with, with five clicks on my cell phone, withdraw money from my savings account. So that makes me a little nervous. Maybe it's going to be harder. It's going to be the, like the cliche of money burning a hole in my pocket. Now, it, now it's just money kind of oozing out of my cell phone. Um, so this is one reason why we're a big fan of figuring out how to attach commitment savings accounts to mobile accounts so that you can put money into your mobile account but then slide the money over to a into a mobile commitment savings account where you can't just be at the, the local kiosk and, um, and withdraw money at will. Wasn't sure whether we should have to be financially included. No, there is no minimum income people should have to be financially included. I mean, we can't. Um, I mean, think about it this way: we certainly don't want to turn someone away and say, "Well, no, you, we're not going to try to include you because you're earning too little money." That's exactly the person we want to help the most.
Um, so I, um, so William's question about the impact of financial inclusion on trade, um, you know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm a little hesitant to put that forward as a goal. It might, you know, it might happen, but I don't think that should be the driving force that motivates one to work on financial inclusion. The driving force should be um, social protection and inequality. Um, and if yes, it ends up happening that with People who are poor now have better access to finance and better access to save, and and then this creates growth and enterprise and trade. Then sure, that's that's great. Um, but that's true of anything too. I mean, you could make the same argument now about a program that improves literacy um, is going to increase trade flows by helping people become more literate, earn more money, buy more things, produce better, increase trade flows. So in a sense, anything can get that argument. And I'm not so sure that that should be what we put forward as the um, motivation um, any more than anything we're doing that increases economic activity um, will have that impact. Um, guess two. However, people can feel they need to earn more money, have higher income to open a bank account. Um, um, yeah, I'm not quite sure. Um, I, mean, I, I, think, I think your point here is that there needs to be a benefit which is higher than the cost. So if the cost is too high to open a bank account, then someone who's really poor won't do it. Um, that just means that the cost of the bank account is too high. That's one of the whole reasons why mobile money is so exciting is because it's dropping the price pretty close to zero. It hopefully in the long run will be zero. Um, for, for households, and then they can be financially included through a mobile money account. Um, some people argue that mobile accounts could increase the expenditure of people buying. Yes, that's exactly, Raquel, this is exactly what I was referring to a moment ago when I said, when I was referring to my, what's exhilarating and then also invoking fear about mobile money accounts. Um, I'm not aware of a study right now set up to test that. I do think that would be a, a really important, useful, and interesting test put forward, but I, I'm not aware of a study doing that. So, any more comments or questions? If there is not, once again, I would like to thank Dean for taking the time to share his work with us. Very interesting and worthwhile webinar. Also, I want to thank to the participants. Next webinar, we have Francois Guriou, researcher of Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago, who will be presenting financial distress and endogenous uncertainty. Have a lovely day, everyone. Buen día para todos. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much, Dean. Muchas gracias. Chao. Bye.